The general approach when you want to exploit a vulnerability in a patched software is to do what we call binary diffing or patch diffing. The idea is you compare the version of the binary before the patch and after the patch. We are going to go over the MSU format, which is the format used by Microsoft to embed the patches. Then we'll talk about the different methods used for doing patch diffing and see their drawbacks and advantages. Okay, let's get started. Microsoft updates are in the MSU format, which stands for Microsoft Update Standalone Package. And so we often refer to the updates as Patch Tuesday because they release the new version of Microsoft Up products every second Tuesday of the month. Microsoft also uses the term KB, which stands for knowledge base, followed by a number that basically uniquely identifies a particular update. Microsoft does release exceptional updates. For instance, if a zero day was exploited in the wild, usually it is only for critical vulnerabilities that can be exploited remotely. And often they did it for vulnerabilities that are warmable. So that is that means they can propagate again and again after exploiting its patient zero target. Similarly to a worm, Microsoft has updated their portal over time, which makes it hard if you're maintaining a tool to parse their portal. But the latest version of their portal is quite nice and you can easily search for things like filtering per product, for instance, Microsoft Exchange or Windows 10 or Office, Office products. You can also filter period or date and they add to the end of the pages what changes in case they update an advisory page with additional information. Patch diffing consists in comparing a version of a file before the patch and after a patch. Obviously, one requirement is that it requires having both versions of the file before the patch and after the patch. And due to the nature of Microsoft updates, you'll see it's not always obvious how to get these two versions. So there are a few reasons why that is the case. The first one is that in the past, an update would only contain a file if it has changed. So you would easily find the patch version in the latest patch Tuesday. However, in order to find the version before the patch, you would need to locate what was the last update that updated that file. And it would be quite time consuming sometimes. Second reason is that nowadays, Microsoft mostly uses cumulative updates, which basically embed all the latest versions of the files since the release of the ISO image. So you will always have all the files that have been changed since that ISO image. Even if it, it was changed a couple of months ago, it would just be duplicated in each new cumulative update without changing it. Except if there is a new patch version, then that new patch version will be duplicated each month until the next one and so on. There is one last thing that started to be used in recent Windows 10 versions, which is that instead of actually having all the executable files like DLLs, exe, in the actual PE format, in the Patch Tuesday updates, what Microsoft does is it uses a special compressed format, which just includes the differences from the first version in the ISO. So it reduces the size of the Patch Tuesday updates overall but it makes it a bit more complicated to reconstruct the versions of the files pre-patch and post-patch because we need them to do binary diffing. You can extract the MSU file by using the expand tool and you will end up getting a few files. The main one we are interested in is a cab file, which is quite big, almost the size of the original MSU. And then you can extract the cab file again with the expand tool again and you end up with a list of all the binaries that are part of that update, such as the .dll, .exe, or .sys files. The expand tool is a tool that is on Windows by default. There are two types of MSU. In the first one, the old format, you would basically embed all the .sys, .dll, and .exe files from the actual PE format, and there is the new format since Windows 10, 18, or 9, which is basically embedding specifically compressed format to reduce the size of the actual update. The old MSU format only contains a file if there is a patch in this monthly update for that particular file. So basically you need to find what month 
actually patch that same file to locate a previous version of that same file if you want to do binary diffing. And so Microsoft does indicate the supersedence of a given KB. So it would typically say that a given KB supersedes another KB. So you could look at the previous KB and extract it to try to find a previous version of the file before the patch. But sometimes you might not find it. So then you would have to do that supersedence game for a few hops before you find the right file. Since Windows 10 18.09, the format of the MSU has changed and now instead of embedding the files in their PE format, they use a compressed format called MS Delta Patch. One confusing thing at first is that they name the files with their normal extensions, so .exe, .dll, .sys, but they are not actual PE files, so you need to reconstruct them yourselves. Also, in one given Patch Tuesday update, you will typically have two versions of the same file. So for instance, you would have two versions of ntdll.dll, one in a subfolder named R for reverse, and another one with a subfolder named F for forward. And so typically, you would need the original ISO image, and you would use the, the file from the F forward folder to reconstruct the version of the file for that particular update. Microsoft does not provide tooling to do the conversion, but they implement the functions in msdelta.dll. So you can basically write your own tool, for example, in Python, that calls into msdelta.dll in order to convert the files and get the version you want. What is binary diffing? It is not just diffing raw bytes. If we were just diffing raw bytes, it would not be super efficient. Because basically, if you compile source code at two different times, the resulting compiled code might be very different and a lot of bytes might have changed in between, but it would not necessarily reflect source code changes. It could also be because they added a new function somewhere and it shifted all the other functions after that function, but there were no actual changes and the, the other functions might not have been modified at all. Another reason could be that the compiler was changed and so the resulting assembly instructions are different due to the compiler itself. Or it could also be due to really small differences into the source code that were compiled entirely differently by the compiler, which is just trying to optimize stuff in general. So yeah, it would be really hard to know what changes were made just from the byte changes. So generally, binary diffing is about ignoring the byte changes and ignoring even the assembly level differences. Instead, binary diffing works on the actual functions flow graphs. That means it is going to look at the basic blocks of a function. So basically, you would typically see basic blocks in a disassembler application like Ida or Ghidra, because it's a series of instructions that if you execute the first instruction of that basic block, you will necessarily execute all the instructions of that block until the last one of that block. And so typically an instructions at the end of a block would jump to the first instruction of another basic block. Sometimes also an instructions can jump from the end of a basic block onto the middle of, of another basic block. And so you would only be looking at the number of basic blocks in order to do binary diffing, not even the actual instructions that are part of that block. Assuming we are more interested to know if a new basic block was added or removed, indicating a significant change in the function logic. We would also be looking at relations between the different functions, since once we have figured out a given function call, for example, like a function calling three other functions inside that function, we can assume it is the case for both the file before the patch and after the patch. And so if that's the case, it means the, the three functions can be matched between the, the file before the patch and after the patch. And this is true even if a new function was added in the patch file before these three functions. And it shifted all these three functions in the final binary. It does not matter because we are working on the function flow graphs. And the cool thing is we can basically apply the same algorithms recursively to the new functions we have matched from the previous function we were diffing and do that over and over. What is really interesting with this method is that it works pretty well and it gives very good results 
since it significantly reduces the number of functions that you have to manually look at when doing binary diffing. Bindiff was initially developed by Zenemix, and it was the first tool to actually implement this kind of algorithm. And now there is Diaphora as well. Diaphora is only for IDA, Pro or Home at the moment, and it doesn't support Ghidra yet at the time of recording. Diaphora is basically a Python plugin that is open source, so you can customize it for like specific algorithm or patterns you would want to use. But because it relies on Python, it's only available in IDA Pro or Home. It is also integrated to IDA. What I mean by that is that you start IDA on both of your binaries that you want to diff. You run the plugin on each side to generate a database associated with each file. And then you diff one of the files directly into the other database, directly from IDA. And it will open new tabs in IDA with the function being matched between the two versions and the differences. And then you can basically click on some results and it will show you the differences either at the assembly level or at the C level if you have the decompiler. All of that directly in IDA. It is basically the recommended tool if you have IDA with Python support. So IDA Pro or IDA Home licenses. One real advantage of Diaphora is that it supports the decompiler. What I mean by that is that Diaphora supports the decompiler for testing the algorithm during comparison but also for showing the actual results after the binary diffing. It is useful because sometimes applying the algorithm on the decompiled code gives you better results. And it is also useful to be able to show the actual diff at the C level because it is sometimes super readable and you can spot the differences very quickly versus if you had to work it out at the basic le block level. Like if the patch is an integer overflow or length check, Generally, looking at the assembly diff is better because you can figure out exactly what is the problem and it is less likely to be error prone. For instance, if the decompiler is not perfect and showing things badly. However, if the patch is changing the general logic of the function by adding a lot of changes at the time, it is often very useful to have the diff at the C level because you can spot the actual changes a lot quicker. An interesting thing is that, for instance, if you wanted to diff x86 versus ARM32 bit, because ARM32 instructions have a lot of conditional instructions, the actual function graph will look significantly different because a single basic block might have a lot of instructions that are actually conditional. But x86 would have a more complicated flow graph than ARM32, possibly. If you want to diff x86 and x64, they are relatively the same, so their flow graph at the assembly level will be quite similar. What is funny with Diaphora too, is you can actually do binary diffing between two different architecture in general, because when you work at the decompiler level, the C code is very likely to be the same. And so I've used the Diaphora between x86 and 64 in the past, and it was pretty helpful. The main advantage of pin diff is that it supports Ghidra on top of IDA. And so Bindiff is quite different from Diaphora in the way you would typically use it. You basically run the plugin from IDA or Ghidra on each binary to generate a database associated with each file in what we call the bin export format. And then this bin export format is imported directly into Bindiff, into like a standalone Bindiff tool that will display the diff. What that means is that you don't actually use IDA or Ghidra to see the actual diff. So you can't really navigate in your disassembler or decompiler to see functions being called, etc., which makes it a lot less nice to use, in my opinion. Also, because it is the standalone bin diff tool that displays the diff, and this tool only supports the assembly level, it doesn't have a decompiler. You can't see the diff at, at the decompiler level either. Ghidra does support something called version tracking. And when Ghidra was released, people tried to use that feature to do binary diffing, but it is, it is not actually binary diffing as we define it. It is just byte diffing, which is basically useless from our perspective. So basically, if you have IDA and the hex race decompiler, the best is to use Diaphora since you'll get the C-level diffing on top of the assembly diffing. But if you don't have the hex race decompiler in IDA, 
there is an alternate three-step way of doing things. So basically, I would recommend you use Diaphora or Bindif in Ida or even Bindif in Ghidra just to get the disassembly level diffing so you can locate the interesting functions that have been changed. And then since Ghidra is free and has a decompiler, you can document these functions in the de Ghidra decompile code. And finally, you can use the, the command line tool called diff or even like a, a tool like WinMerge to compare the decompiler output as if they were actually text files or source code files. So yeah, just to summarize, Diaphora works very well if you have a decompiler in Ida and it doesn't support Ghidra. Bindiff does work both with Ghidra and Ida, but doesn't actually support the decompiler and is its own standalone tool.